OK. <laughs> to som pochopil. OK. Zdravím všetkých. Rád by som vás privítal na prezentácii SOM Mainlines 2021 Roaming Go Upstream. Predtým než začneme, chcel by som teda povedať, že prezentácia bude po anglicky. Ďakujem za pochopenie. So, hello everyone. I would like to welcome you to a presentation called SOM Mainlines 2021 Roaming Into Upstream. Before we start, I would just say that the presentation will be full in English. Thank you for understanding. And now with the boring stuff over, let's start. So, who are we? Well, I will keep this section short as we went over this in quite a detail in our last year presentation, which you can watch yourself, of course, after this one on OpenNote YouTube Archive. But since not everybody was here last year, I think it's only fair to introduce ourselves. We are so mainline, a team of skilled developers who are in our free time trying to bring open source software to masses via hardware that are already owned. We also try to document most of what we discover and of course upstream everything we do. Oh yeah, and if you noticed, we finally have a logo. Now for some introduction of the people that are here and even those that are not presenting. I am Martin Botka. I am 21 years old and old embedded kernel developer currently studying applied informatics. I started tinkering with code and devices at the age of 10 and I am not planning to stop anytime soon. I enjoy updating kernel, writing drivers, bringing up devices to mainline Linux, and etc. I also contribute to a few open source projects, but main one being Sony Open Devices. And also, I am a massive 3D printing nerd. Sometimes a bit too much, some would say. Now, please, Angelo, tell us a bit about yourself. Hello. Hi, I'm Angelo. Guess my age, or if you're curious, you can probably find that anywhere. So here at OpenAll, last year I said I was grumpy and maybe I still am, whatever. Uh, it's a joke, an old one, but it's still working, right? Nope. <laughs> whatever. Uh, about me, I'm in love with the Linux kernel and small form factor ARM and ARC64 boards and SBCs. And I've gained interest in Linux development about 20 years ago. Also, if you notice a hint of frustration in my eyes, that's simply because I've been a Yento user for all this time as well. Also, this year I prob probably joined Colabra, an open source consultancy that is accelerating the adoption of open source technologies, methodologies, and philosophy. Oh, and by the way, we are hiring. So now you know me, and I'm sure that you can totally understand my love for open source, which is what I've been doing for my entire life. But it's time for me to let someone else present themselves. Please, Rain, go on. Hi, everyone. I'm Rain, and I'm also still a student, but I'm also working during the day at Traverse Research. I'll be researching graphics, hardware, and software there. And we also do a lot of open source, in particular on Rust, so please check us out. For me, this entire journey started back when I needed replacement software for my Sony phone, back when the official software, back then it was called the Sony Concept Project, ceased to exist. I joined the Sony Open Devices project quite some time ago already and have been maintaining more and more devices since. On the side, together with Angelo a couple of years ago, we started looking at older devices and, again, that were on the brink of being deprecated from the project. It seemed the upstream kernel and project had gained enough traction to perhaps support these devices on a mainline Linux kernel one day. And so our journey began, mainlining a phone and two more phones, and even new team members followed leading all the way up to this talk right here and right now. Before I hand the word over to Martin to introduce all the new team members, it remains me to say that even they think I contribute way too much to open source projects, ranging from the kernel to some user space components, our Android setup, and mostly unrelated to, to, to mainlining, a host of Rust traits. With that out of the way, Martin, please introduce the rest of our team. Hey, come on. So let's introduce the rest of the team. One of my members, whom some of you may remember if they were last year, Conrad Ipsia. He is the kind of person that shows up exactly when you don't expect him to. He loves doing the very, very early bring ups of the devices and thus also jumps from device to device, or should I rather say from device tree to device tree. But he also helps massively when we have issues bringing up some ecosystems on devices, for example, embedded condom, uh, modem. And this would be an entire team if it was last year, but the truth is we did get a few more members whom you probably didn't meet yet. And while they are not presenting with us today, they are absolutely part of the team. Let's start with Yami Kitunen. He is our user space image expert, 
maintains our so mainline Void Linux CL, so automated builds of our Void Linux images, and also maintains the images themselves. So what goes into the new build, how it builds, and etc. And we have to give him a massive kudos for the work I did on those. Absolutely amazing. Oh, and right about the Void Linux images. Continue to watch. We will talk about them later. Now for Oleg Vorobyov. Oleg is our Python evangelist. In his free time, Oleg does open source stuff, virtual reality, and loves it deeply. He also writes some user space drivers and joined so mainline for developing Hyperfocal. As before, continue to watch as we will talk and possibly show some things about it. Oleg is also a student studying theoretical mathematics and thus he is an insane nerd. Um, Thus, we make a lot of numbers. <laughs> and when he's in the chat, it usually turns into chaos. But you know, the good kind. And now with the Oleg introduction over, that leaves only one member left. And that is Paul Boha, whom uh, is our public relations person. But don't let it confuse you. Well, he's our PR. He's also very, very good Android developer. And with that done, I will leave the word to Marin to tell us a bit about some mainline values and etc. Please, Martin. Thank you, Martin, for introducing the rest of our team. Together, we as so mainline try to get a lot of work done, but it's not just that that brings us all together. Our best experiences with software development in the industry is teaching us that we have to do things differently. Effectively, that comes down to these core values that pretty much define why we spent countless hours in our free time working on these various open source projects. First up is openness. It's clear that being open already allows us to work together in the first place. Together, we can build something that's peer reviewed and subsequently usable by everyone and allows future generations to improve upon. Collaboration comes down to, for example, using stable interfaces and systems that the upstream kernel provides and why many Linux distributions have come to rely on, in turn making it easier for software to coexist and interoperate without needing to be reinvented. Alas, this is exactly what OpenAlt is about. With this approach, we invest our time in extending and improving projects that already get lots of attention from other community members. With the Linux kernel, that means the continued stream of security and stability fixes that flow in without any efforts to port those fixes back down to a downstream kernel, which usually is forgotten about or stops after a couple of years. This greatly improves the safe lifespan of a device, but also allows it to live on much longer without missing out on the newest technologies. Of course, as long as the hardware can physically cope with it, these two points have a lot in common with reusability. The kernel and most user space applications are exactly built to abstract away over the hardware, providing subsystems that implement most of the common functionality every device of this type needs. Where a downstream kernel may re-implement the same functionality time and time again, each time with its own subtle little issues, a generic approach makes it possible to attain consistency and the possibility for fix one, fix all approach, and resulting in a lot less code duplication in the end. Of course, no hardware is alike, and care has to be taken that this generic system remains generic enough, because it also goes in reverse. If you break one device, you're very likely to break them all. If you break one device, maybe you fix the other. The way that we achieve this is by working together with the upstream developers and maintainers. Short refresher, Linux has a hierarchy of maintainers, each making sure that the patches they accept are accepted by them, accepted by multiple communities or com community members or other trustworthy maintainers, though usually it's a combination of these. Maintainers higher up in this hierarchy see more and more patches and will thus have to rely on their sub-maintainers to have reviewed a patch or patch series as they cannot review every individual line change. But that again depends on the type of patch that is going into the kernel tree. For example, a driver specific to a single phone or board is unlikely to affect anything else in the ecosystem, thus trusting those who have built and tested the patches usually enough. On the other hand, changes to the entire subsystem or to popular hardware will require more parties to scrutinize the patches and agree on it before they go in. And this is exactly what we are also doing on the mailing list. Besides submitting the necessary additions to describe our hardware, we are making sure to give maintainers a hand by testing and reviewing relevant patches for them. Because, as I mentioned before, being able to share a lot of code makes it much more likely that one change affects our devices as well or that it is perhaps even a new driver that introduces support for a feature we haven't even gotten to yet. Next to that is a lot of preliminary discussions with community members to support new features or to support certain very specific hardware quirks that the current kernel cannot properly deal with yet. Looking at you, IOMMU. In addition to that, especially now that we are rounding out kernel support for more and more of our devices, 
focus is shifting towards user space components, which may sometimes also have their fair share of hardware specific code, simply because it was deemed more reasonable to implement that in user space. Prime example being Massa, which provides graphic support for the Adreno GPUs found in our phones. While the majority of functionality for these GPUs is implemented, there exist many different variations and not every GPU has been tested against Massa yet. As part of our goal to fully upstream these devices, we'll have to make sure that the remaining set of features, though usually these are nothing more than a set of quirks, also land upstream. We expect this region to expand even further as kernel support completes and more of the remaining features are bound to user space components. Think about audio support, being able to place calls, use the GPS, or reading the various sensors that are on board of a phone. Fortunately, we are not alone, and much of the community around Linux phones is already looking into these subjects or already has them working. In that case, all that remains for us is to validate or add support for the hardware that we already have access to. To sum this all up, not all of our work is submitting fresh and new shiny drivers to the kernel tree. More of it is spent working together to find optimal solutions to hard problems in a way that works out for everyone. And in addition, we'll also help at left and right to clean, improve, and maintain the kernel wherever our expertise reaches. We have already mentioned our slight affection to Sony devices, and I just mentioned Adreno GPUs, so now seems about the right time to cover what kind of devices and hardware we actually have our hands on. It goes without saying that 99% of the changes we submit upstream affect hardware that we own that we are actively able to test and develop on. Starting with the Sony phones, this is simply because that is what brought most of us together. We've all been involved with their open devices project at some point, and mainlining is only a logical continuation of that. Conrad somehow has a more broad affection with anything that has a CPU, and he even managed to mainline the modem that is found in the Pinephone, though also working closely with the developers of the Pinephone to round out specific features related to Bluetooth audio, for example. Alongside that, Angelo has been working on the Tech Pro 1, which is supposed to be a small form factor laptop, though literally in the size of a phone, with a slide out keyboard. Yami joined us while we're using his OnePlus phone to test and develop on. Fortunately, both devices happen to have the same SOC. Last but not least, I probably missed at least some devices and vendors, but more importantly, maybe your device could be in this list as well. We're currently already incredibly busy with the vast amount of Sony devices on all of our desks combined, but are always on the lookout for new and exciting hardware. Speaking of a vast amount of devices, let's jump right into the progress we've made since last year. Starting with our LoRa phone, like I said in, in my introduction, this is where Angelo and me started the journey about two years ago. Oh, did we learn? The, the approach we followed was mostly a make the entire thing work first, then upstream mentality, which basically means that it's one of the only phones we have that still have a lot of working patches sitting on our local tree that have not been upstream yet, which is far from ideal. And we learned from that. So most of the phones that we are working on now have their support submitted mostly upstream already. But it's still a pretty usable phone, usable as a proof of concept, for example. The display works just fine. The GPU works, Wi-Fi works, and Bluetooth also worked at some point, but got broken at another, but we have not yet figured out why yet. The only things that then remain are making the modem work so that you can actually use the phone as a phone. We have to figure out audio. The device cannot suspend yet, so you cannot really put it in your pocket. And we need a charger driver to get the batteries charged because that's still a large missing chunk. And I said the display is fine, but actually it's fine that it doesn't show any corruption. It's very slow. You cannot really use this out of, as a phone with, with such low UI, but here again, also working on the missing components to scale the CPU and CPR clocks up so that we can finally have a fast enough phone. Moving on from this pack project of Angelo and me, why don't we look at Martin's favorite phone? <laughs> Thank you, Martin. So status update around SM6125, or well, Xperia same platform, which uses this SOC. Internally named as Martin's baby, for the reason that I mainly touched this from the start and love the platform. So the working things list is quite small, but the phone can boot into UI without GPU and display driver though, which means that we are stuck on bootloader configure display and just using frame buffer. So it's slow, but we can at the very least boot from internal storage, which is EMC and get SSH to it via uh, USB. And for some magical reason, it didn't explode, at least yet. Um, thanks to Marine, we have work in progress GPU, which is kind of working, but not really. 
I still have to get to sending the RPM PD budget uh, for enabling RPM power distribution. So what is really holding us back now? Well, first thing is to get the DPU working properly. After that, display driver for it and then GPU. This should enable us to get somewhat usable phone and possibly be for doing GPU regulators may be needed. And then we can go from there. Now I will give the word to Marin, who will tell us a bit more about our devices. Yes, we have a lot more devices, but unfortunately, none of the phones in this list are more special than what we have already shown on Wari and Sing before. Fortunately, all the these phones already have much better as upstream SOC support, so getting the final things like the modem or audio, or more importantly, fixing all the performance issues is much more straightforward or not even an issue anymore, because we've already done it. However, there's one major caveat. At least the top part of this list does not have a working display, making it impossible to test the GPU or complicated to test any phone-like features without a UI available. That is the DPU that we'll be going to later. Now that we've seen all the hardware that we are working on, let us move on to what you can actually do on it. Picking up string kernels run on these devices brings a lot of opportunities, besides just security updates. The ability to run any software you want, just like on your Linux desktop PC, gives you the choice to reuse your device for something you may not have, it may not have been intended for. Feel free to put a web server on it or use it as a small, low-power computing machine that sits somewhere in the corner of your room. Or use it as a desktop PC with your favorite ma window manager after attaching a keyboard and mouse. Needless to say, there already exist various phone shells that make your distro usable with just a touch screen. The choice is truly yours, as Martin will show you now with even more use cases we have in mind. Thank you, Martin. So, the wrapper procedure of the device. Doesn't it sound cool? And yes, it does, and there is a reason why. <laughs> Mainly because it is very cool. But let's look why so. Well, look into your desk. I'm nearly sure there is some old old device in there that is just waiting for being repurposed into something else. But why do it? Well, of course, eco-friendly is one of the main reasons, but we'll talk about this later. For now, let's focus on the tech side of things. How could we hack our devices? Well, let's take it for this as an example. You are enjoying some movie and it stops playing with the nasty loading circle, which we all hate. You look at your phone and your Wi-Fi is not being shown anymore. Your router has just died. And really horrible thing to happen at really absolutely horrible time. But then you really remember that you have a few USB to Ethernet adapters. I mean, after all, it's 10 p.m. So no shop is going to sell your router at this time. So you do what any other crazy person would do. <laughs> Install OpenVRT on it and plug in these USB to Ethernet adapters and finish watching the rest of the movie and possibly watch even a few more. I mean, why couldn't you? OpenVRT is just a very specific Linux distro. While not being useful for normal usage, it's very great for what it does. And the story is not even made up. I had a similar thing happen to me <laughs> and had to use my phone as a makeshift Wi-Fi connection. But let's say that Wi-Fi connection is not a problem and say you are a retro gamer. And while you could just use any low power SBC, which is single board computer, why would you when you have a 40 year old phone that beats nearly all of them? Nothing is stopping you from just installing any distro you want and installing an emulator with all your, of course, legally obtained copies of your amazing retro games. <laughs> and what's amazing is that even the other phones have full HD screens. With a little bit of work, mainly in gamepad, you can now have your very own portable gaming machine, which performs very well, even beating some of the commercial offerings. But now for some of the truly curiosities, shall we? Our phones have so many cameras now, three, two, four. Why not use them for something truly cool? How about a little bit of machine learning camera tracking? What may have been literally science fiction to even think about few years ago is now possible. And it's not only possible. Our phones can do a great job at it. And uh, but I can imagine it will take less than three days to get any of these to work if the drivers for the hardware were there, of course. But Marine also has a bit more ideas. Please, Marine, just, uh, 
Nope. Oh yeah, uh, sorry. Let's talk about the side, uh, echo side of reprocessing your raw device, right? Just a quick disclaimer before we start. I am in no way qualified to talk about echo, so please take it all with a bit of salt. <laughs> I think it's fairly obvious how using your device for longer is better for the world, but let's get more into it, shall we? I asked a bit around uh, how long people usually use their one fo phone for. The average time is around two to three years. And I also asked what's the main problem with uh, when they switch and also the secondary. And to no surprise, the first reason is mainly battery life. But rather surprisingly, the second thing is slow responsiveness, outdated software, and of course, better camera. I also asked if people would be happy to use their phones for much longer if these issues were not an issue anymore. And vast majority of people in the survey answered that they would gladly use their phone for much longer, even years longer. So what can we do about this all? Well, as for the battery, it's quite easy repair on most phones, but sadly it's becoming more expensive. I will talk about this later. For the slow responsiveness and outdated software and cameras, we get into rather interesting territory. It's usually good practice to wipe your phone every year or so, but let's be honest here. Who does that? I know I don't. But if we did this, we should be fine to keep the phone running fine and responsibly at least for a few more years to come. After all, the main problem with responsivity is the fact that people blow their system with so many apps. And I know from experience myself that a lot of people don't even wipe their recently used app list. And then they are just wondering why their phone is lagging when they started watching the YouTube video after they played the game, which is of course still in the memory and still eating up resources. And this is not any fault. This is Android things to make the user experience better, sort of. But let's move to the camera. How can we have a better camera without buying a new phone? Seems like an impossible task, doesn't it? And well, it couldn't be further from the truth. It's not that complicated, actually. For example, 8.1 megapixel camera on some phones can capture enough data to take a 4K picture. Take into account that most people don't even have 4K monitors yet to see the full detail, or even 4K phones, which are even more rare, but do exist. But then why do cameras on newer phones look better? And there is one simple word for that, processing. It is true that most of the benefits come from having better pass processing. More technical people already know that by switching to a different camera app, they can get far, far better looking pictures than the stock provided camera app, mainly because of the processing that camera does in the background. And now for the software. Can we make it so that a 10 year old phone can run the software that the latest phone can? And yes, yes, we absolutely can. <laughs> it just takes time and pain, tiny bit. Well, yes, you can absolutely go and backport new kernel patches from your downstream kernel to make your old device compatible with the new Android version, for example, but it ain't ideal. Next time's time. And the kernel isn't the end even. You also have to update the device tree for Android according to the new changes and, of course, update the holes. Those are hardware abstraction layers for those initiated. But what if we could minimize this or even completely Eliminate it. Well, it mostly can. It is what we are actually doing by porting devices to mainline Linux kernel. We would no longer need to clutter and have hacky code in holes. Camera would need one hole for mostly all devices because the kernel provides stable API to communicate with it. And the same goes for nearly all of the functions and the hardware in the phone. But how about eliminating it? At least the hard side of things. Well, there is one quick solution. Nobody said we are limited to Android after all. Let's take, for example, Wi-Fi on mainline Linux kernel, right? On Android, we would have to either find already written all for this or write one, which ain't ideal, of course. But then we didn't have to do anything like this on any Linux distro. It just sort of works. We tested our devices on post OS and even our own void Linux builds. 
stay tuned for those as we'll talk about this later. And this is all amazing and great, but why do companies stay in their old ways when such things are available to them? Some even refusing to provide battery replacements for the phones they are already made. And I do not mean they would replace the battery for you. I just mean they do not provide the battery itself to you. This is unfortunate as people have to buy from third party sellers who sell either refurbished battery or new one, but you may get scammed there. Not to even mention companies are making it harder and harder for people to replace the batteries and those repair shops have to ask for more and more money to replace the battery. A thing that few years ago was just take the back cover of your phone and take out the old battery, put in a new one and off you go, has Oh, right, has become a complete mess and taking your entire phone apart. You have to open the phone, pull out the tabs. By the way, the tabs usually crack. Thus, you have to pry on the battery with some plastic thing or metal, which is in no way safe. And because of this, people leave it mostly repair shops and the prices for this can reach up to half the cost of the device because yes it is quite hard nowadays so what can people do they rather buy a new phone and i fully understand them it's not their phone after all. it's not their fault after all the camera which looked like a hardware issue is indeed mostly just software after all Companies are just updating their kernel apps for newer phones because, well, look at this from this side. If they released it on a two-year-old phone, well, people would, of course, not buy the new phone if they saw the quality jump, now would they? And we can't be mad at them for that. It's just business. The company has to pay the engineers working on all this and etc. If they were to release such update, they would be losing a lot of money. But let's now talk about why companies are not shipping devices with mainline Linux kernel, as it solves so many issues currently users are facing. Well, yes. the issue. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, yeah. we can. Yeah, Mar Martin had some note about the battery, so he's worried about uh, catching uh, fire of the battery when being on charger after a couple of years. I'm not sure if if, if you was speaking about that already. <laughs> um, I wasn't speaking about it, no, but uh, the charging of the batteries, we will get into that uh, on mainline later a bit. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> no problem. But let's now look uh, why companies are still not shipping devices with the mainline Linux kernel as it would solve so many issues currently users are facing. Well, the issue is mostly time for them. It's far easier for the companies to just ship the good old BSP kernel they get from the SLC maker. It means minimal work for them and things usually just work and that's all they care about after all. And unfortunately, there isn't much we can do if the companies are not willing. And they won't be willing until the other companies that make the chips write drivers and other required stuff for it on the mainline Linux kernel and send the patches. But there are also other ways to mainline the phone and then release the update down the line if they wish so. But some companies would first have to do that and show others that it's possible. But how about when your phone truly gets outdated in the hardware side of things, or even worse, when the hardware breaks? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you just could own a phone that you could update or upgrade the hardware of by just swapping some modules? Well, of course it would. And companies are luckily not that scared to experiment in this territory, we learned. We can't go into this topic without mentioning Shift or Fairphone or other companies we didn't mention here. But most of them are non modular in the normal sense of the word, but they are made to be opened and repaired without being scared. And when normal customers say that they can't do what Fairphone or Shift does or other companies, Otherwise, they can't give customers the hard way they want or innovate as much, some say. It could not be from the further truth. The, phone is the phones are very competitive performance-wise. So not only phones is not only the phones are competitive, they are also very eco-friendly. But we feel like there is still that one 
thing that they could do to reduce the amount of phones going to waste. Let's learn about it. Due to our small survey, you learned that the reason for choosing new phone is usually uh, is usually older software. And since both of the phones are shipping with BSP kernel, it isn't possible to support the phones without immense amount of work from OEM for more than two years or so. And we know that it takes a lot of time to mainline some phones. We do have a quite a bit of experience in this after all ourselves. If they could somehow get the phone mainlined, we feel like it would be a truly incredible phone, or phones even. And if companies are scared of mainlining their phones, they should not be. We sent support for a few phones last year. It's been a year or so, and that's a few major kernel versions. We sent them around the 5.8 time, and just a few days ago, 5.15 has been released, and 5.16 is already in development. And the best part? The phones are still supported and still working. And that's with minimal fixes, if any regressions were of course found on our side. I think we only had like two, which were fixed in the few days. So let's sum it up. Companies should start selling replacement parts, official ones. Not the stuff you find on eBay. If they did so, they could probably make more money and down the road, I would be far more willing to buy from the same company, as I know I can use the phone for much longer. They should also focus on the software side of things, and if the company can't handle it, then there are other ways to get the device mainlined. But we won't get over that in this presentation. I will now leave the word to Angelo, who will tell us a bit about this place. Angelo. This place, you give them for granted. They're everywhere and have been among us for countless years. But do you actually know what they are? Let's see. Whether you want to run the latest and greatest software on your smartphone or you're repurposing any consumer device for a very different use case than B, or even on single board computers, there are a lot of scenarios in which you would really need to see something. So you need an actually work in display on such device. Let's go for a very fast overview of the most common ways to send and display an image. And let's start with SPI. Some display driver ICs are using this bus, but that's for very low resolution, so very small screens. We are generally talking about very capable SOCs here, so this may not be a good option for you. As a note, if you're repurposing a consumer device, good luck finding usable SPI test points. Whatever is not used in the final product usually doesn't even get exposed, that it gets safely terminated. Getting to the others, we have DisplayPort or Embedded DisplayPort and HDMI. These are becoming pretty common in consumer devices like smartphones and tablets. As these are meant to, meant to give you a way to connect your small device to a big screen for movies, presentations, and even games. It's worth mentioning that some ARM64 laptops, like the Snapdragon powered laptops, running some version of Microsoft Windows, do sometimes have their internal display connected to Embedded DisplayPort, or EDP. The good of these standards is that they have to support a feature called Extended Display Identification, or EDID. This means that the display will send data to your SOC's display subsystem, describing its capabilities, such as its resolution and other little things that are essential for driving it, where driving means do something to show an image on said screen. This is something really great, as there's no custom driver to write for each piece of hardware. You have something generic that just works. The last ones that we will mention are MIPI DSI displays. I know we may be boring some developers around, but hey, this presentation is for everyone, and everyone has the right to understand what we're saying, right? You may have heard the acronym MIPI before, and it stands for Mobile Industry Processor Interface. Do we have any bells ringing now? Also, that alone means nothing, but also means everything. So the key here is DSI, Display Serial Interface. Yes, this is a most common interface for displays in mobile applications, some single-board single computers and some laptops too. This standard, though, 
doesn't give any DID. So you, developer, have to write one driver for each display and its little chip that's responsible for sending an image to it, the display driver I see. The only standard things there are some commands, but display driver IC manufacturers always put custom ones specific to even just one of their chip models. At this point, you should have understood that if your device has got a display port or a HDMI primary display, in a way, you're sort of lucky. Well, if you got a MiFi display, it's a bit more complicated. Okay, for experienced developers, there's nothing too complicated about MiFi displays, but wait, the frustrating part is just about to start. First of all, as I mentioned, apart from the standard commands that are required to initialize a display, some more advanced features, which may seem pretty basic to someone like gamma control, color calibration, or sometimes even special screen brightness controls like the famous high brightness mode or HPM, which makes you use your screen at full brightness or other parameters mm, useful to control the refresh rate of your display or its resolution are controlled with proprietary commands. But that wouldn't be an issue if it wasn't for, for the fact that, well, good luck finding any reference or any document or anything about these. We are aware that some vendors do actually give these documents, but it's about 1% of them. But wait, it's not over yet. I said already that my five displays are giving you no data, right? No. Now, what if I tell you that, for example, some smartphone manufacturer likes to buy multiple types of displays and release the same device model with the same model number and the same literally everything, but not necessarily with the same display. I'm sure that you understand what, what happens, especially in this electronics shortage period where manufacturers around the world cannot rely on one single supplier, but this happened even before for the same reasons or for others. You may say, but manufacturers can't just give you a different display and produce different product experiences for different people. Yes, that's totally true. And in fact, they don't. Or better said, they do, but the different displays, even though they use a different display panel and a different display driver chip, are equivalent or just a little more technically. They are within the specification. This means that the variation is so little that the end user won't visually perceive it under normal circumstances. We agree at least that most of the time it was exactly like that for us. Though I may have mentioned it already. <laughs> Wi-Fi displays are giving you no data. And also, have I said already that you get no data from Wi-Fi displays? So <laughs> if we get such such a product, we are playing the display lottery, right? Right? <laughs> but wait a minute. Some data can can actually be retrieved um, if you politely ask to your display or to something else. The technique here may be different from one vendor to another, but there is one. Let's explore how. Some vendors uh, like to write some number in a portion of the display driver chip's persistent storage, which is usually a one-time programmable storage. And if they did that, then you can retrieve that data either through standard MyPy commands or proprietary commands, depending on the chip. Some others, or even the same ones as before, are adopting a smart technique. They reserve one more pin on the display connector. This pin goes to an analog pin for Arduino lovers, or more appropriately, to an ADC input pin. The technique here is to read the value of that resistor, which is different from the one that they put on a different display that's allocated to produce that device. In both cases, though, the data or the resistor value is not unique. For example, um, tablet maker A and tablet maker B are both using more than one display to produce their device. Tablet maker A writes number one or uses a one kilo ohm resistor for display one and writes number two or uses a 100 kilo ohm resistor for display two. 
Tablet Maker B does exactly the same. It's not granted, though, that Tablet Maker A and Tablet Maker B are using the same displays. They may be completely different displays, requiring completely different drivers, even if the resistor value is the same between display 2 of Table and Maker A and B. This means that ways to recognize the hardware are also vendor specific. Now, that's not necessarily unsolvable, nor anything like that, but there's the big point. Linux has no framework, no API, nothing that can really solve this problem effectively. Also, it's nothing very easy to solve either. Um, after all, what can you do about it? Are the probe mechanism based on resistor values? Due to how manufacturers are differentiating between displays in a manufacturer-specific way, that cannot really be standardized in software. Or are the probe mechanism based on the data that the vendor puts in, a, in that small persistent memory area? You know, that's also not a good idea for how things are right now. We have a lot of ideas that would have come to this issue, but none of these is really upstreamable, nor standard, nor clean for that matter. And that's why we are doing this. We think that by raising people's awareness around mainline Linux, by making it usable on more and more consumer devices, we'll give manufacturers reasons to do something about this in a way or another, and we mean an open source friendly way. And uh, speaking of open source, have I mentioned how complicated it is to manage power delivery to a smartphone display? It doesn't look complicated to just throw some power at it and call it a day, does it? Well, actually, things are a bit different, especially on smartphones. Um, everything runs off of a battery, and it's not a constant voltage source, as that depends on the charge level of your battery. But I won't go hardware deep, as that would be a very, very large topic. But what you should know is that there are two main reasons for which all of this may be complicated. First, displays require a big amount of power and a very precise voltage. Otherwise, well, they may not power up or they may just burn. Second, your battery isn't capable of supplying a voltage that is as high as the one that you need to give power to your display. At least, even though that may not be true in every use case, that's true in the smartphone case. This is why chip makers are usually put in a so-called regulator, which is responsible for boosting the voltage as high as what your display needs, and also to limit the current to it, protecting your hardware, even in disastrous events, by not only applying those limits, but by automatically powering it down. That is, uh, in some cases, if your operating system knows about these protections and how to activate them, at least uh, this year, we have been able to upstream support for such regulators, funding a number of Qualcomm SOCs with all of the protections and recovery mechanisms in place. Have we made upstream safe? No, not yet. But it can be a little safer now for a lot of devices run. It's a step, right? Well, um, anyway, displays are definitely bringing us to the next topic, right? Yes, now that we know how to send data to the display, let us look at how the SOC is managing to send this data in the first place. For that, we have to start with an overview of how DRM KMS works, or rather, kernel mode setting inside the direct rendering manager subsystem. Let's start on the slide with the green blocks on the left. That's basically a frame that you want to present a plane that is perhaps a background image or something that was rendered by the GPU or even by software rendering that resides in memory. Then we have a CRTC, and what this literally means is a cathode ray tube controller. It's literally from the old days, and it's still applied because it still makes sense. That is the thing that keeps track of all these planes and where you tell them that you want them to be shown on the screen. So from there, the cathode ray tube controller reads the data from these buffers and then throws them over to the encoder, depending on where you want to see them on the screen. And this encoder is responsible for sending the data to your screen finally. It is what communicates with the screen. So for example, over MIPI DCS. And finally, we have the connector. This is just a representation of the physical connection 
itself and doesn't do anything else. On Qualcomm platforms, QD acceleration is implemented by the MDP4, the MDP5, and the DPU, or rather the display processing unit. The latter driver implements support for what is called the Snapdragon Display Engine downstream. On our Sony phones, we are only using the MDP5 and the DPU though. Fortunately, these look much alike, with the latter having newer hardware blocks, but the core concepts and registers remain virtually the same. Unfortunately, most of the upstream Linux community seems to be running video mode panels, which is a type of panel that receives a continuous video stream without anything intervening. Command mode panels, the ones that we have, do not receive a continuous stream, but rather they have to be a bit smarter and tell the SOC when they are ready to receive the next stream. This happens through a so-called VSync interrupt, and it's the only thing that has caused a significant trouble on both the MDP5 and on the DPU. On the MDP5, we always had very sluggish displays, and as it turns out, VSync was a problem. We were not receiving any such interrupts from the panel, leading to the MDP5 hardware block providing fallbacks interrupts just in case, but at a way too slow pace, so you expect like five seconds per frame. After we managed to fix that, which by the way took a lot of time to uncover, but it only took a few lines to fix and they have already landed upstream, we are now able to have a working tier free display. DPU, however, is a bit more complicated. As we learned just a few weeks ago, the new phones we mentioned earlier, the ones that we have that have no display output and are only lighting up a few random pixels here and there when you turn on, them on, happen to have a newer version of this VSync hardware block and support for it is not implemented upstream yet. Adding it has proven to be more tricky than just adopting the downstream code. After all, the Snapdragon display engine driver from downstream looks very much like the DPU driver that we can find upstream just now. But Rest assured that we're working very hard to bring this to completion sooner rather than later. Having 2D compo compositing acceleration like this is great and all, but most things including UI can be rendered on the GPU, which mainly is for 3D graphics as well. Angelo, please tell us something more about our beloved Adreno. Of course, let's now really go to the next topic then. After all, uh, if at this point you have a safely work in display, you're not going to be happy with a frame buffer slideshow, would you? On the Qualcomm chips, um, historic, historically, the GPU has been called Adreno, and it's still called like that nowadays after many iterations and evolutions of this hardware. Though, pay attention, I said historically, that means a lot. Let's start with a funny curiosity about the Adreno name. Did you know that this is an anagram of Radian? And did you know that Radian's microcode is called PM4, and that's casually the same name associated with the Adreno microcode? Uh, just to be clear, when I said Radian, I was really meaning that one from AMD, or actually, if we want to be a bit more time correct, we should say ATI Technologies. Am I too old, or do you also remember them? I can imagine some of your faces. So, after acknowledging that I'm definitely indeed old, before you point your guns at me, let me make a small yet very important clarification. To be even more historically correct in its origin, it, this GPU was called Imagion, not Radian. Though apparently the first version of Imagion supporting 3D rendering was somehow similar to the Radian of that era. But if you're wondering why am I being an archaeologist here in a tech conference, that's because I went too slow. And next time I'll go faster so that you won't have time to actually think about that. Either way, AMD sold the entire Imagion division to Qualcomm, and that was around 2009. And can you imagine if that happened this year? I mean, you know, AMD GPU is completely open source and what if Adreno was similar to that? Just, wow, we would definitely have rather great support compared to what we have now. I mean, it's not like it's too bad right now, but it can definitely be better, at least performance-wise. Before I go on, though, small parenthesis here is totally deserved. Just to make sure you don't misunderstand me, I'd really like to express all my appreciation and to give a big thank you to Rob Clark and every other developer that's involved in the free Drano project. Big kudos, guys. You're doing great. Keep up the good work. And by now, you may have imagined why I'm being an archaeologist. My point here is, 
if open source was embraced like it is right now, more than 10 years ago, it's obvious, isn't it? In any case, there's someone that I know that really wants to say something more about this entire Paul Camadrano situation. Please, Moran, go on. Indeed, Angelo. If different choices were made 10 years ago, I would not be talking about this right now. And one major problem that we have on the device is that with the free Adreno driver, as much as it is maintained, we only get 3 FPS on the Adreno 5 series, so that's the older GPU. As you can see in the picture, you may, might see the faint green horizontal lines at the bottom. All these bars on the screen should be below that line to be on time to be presented, but they are far, far, far above. We are spending way too much time rendering, and that makes it so that the display doesn't update as often, and you get a very sluggish experience. Also note that these GPUs have only been tested on the flagship version, so the A530 and also the A510. All its slower siblings, or its smaller siblings rather, have not really been used a whole lot on the MESA driver. It's not only the performance that is our issue, though. The si these siblings have much more weird quirks that, that we are uncovering right now as we are bringing up these devices starting with a buffer-to-buffer -buffer copy strategy that seems to be different on these devices, and nobody has implemented the upstream yet because nobody ran into them yet. This is a, a, a screenshot of running RenderDoc while trying to uncover some issue, and even RenderDoc itself doesn't render correctly because it tries to read a buffer and run it up to the display, but the buffer copy itself is full of corruption. We're still working on figuring out why that is the case, though. And this corruption saga continues, this time not with buffer copies, but with sampling render target. What you see here on the screen is Android rendering a bunch of text in a marquee style. On the left and right side of this text, where you now see these weird yellow blocks, it's supposed to be a little fade so that the text disappears into the blackness. However, that is not the case on the A509 where this screenshot was taken or this picture was taken. You can see that it's a bit yellow. It, it matches the, the yellow that's shown on pretty much the rest of the screen. So we have some kind of sampling issue going on because really, most of this should just be black. Again, this is also an issue we're, we're looking at, but keep it. I again have to thank the Freeduino project for all the tools they've made to uncover these issues in the first place and to be able to figure out what is going on. And we are definitely working to, to resolve these sooner rather than later. Now that we've had time to have this deep dive into some of the issues we're looking at on a daily basis, why don't we take a look at two higher level topics that we also spend our time on over at some mainline? I want to start with Rust. Rust is a relatively new programming language that aims to solve some of the most common pitfalls with settled languages like C and C++. Bugs surrounding memory corruption have plagued these languages for years, which Rust solves by simply not allowing those invalid constructs in the first place, but it still provides bare metal performance we have come to expect. In fact, the kernel is already slowly working towards adopting Rust maybe one day, which is very great to see, especially since most drivers that we have in the kernel tree do not need to have all this special hardware access and everything. They just are implemented there because it's most convenient, but they don't need all the rights. So they should also not be able to take the entire kernel down if there's just a sim simple single memory bug in some corner. Android is also fully adopting it with Android 12 actually shipping with a lot of code written in Rust already, which is great to see. Maybe your open source project will follow too. Ours certainly are. And another high-level topic we want to cover, cameras. Cameras are a bit of a touchy subject. One of the things we are we, we have ran into is that V4L2 doesn't support multiple streams coming from a camera hardware device. This is fine for your webcam because you only expect one stream to ever come out. But on your phone, we see usually multiple streams, one for taking a picture, one for doing some processing on the side, one for showing a preview on the screen. And this is not possible. So we'll have to figure something out for that. Secondly. Lip camera also exists, which is a really nice tool to make sure that we can actually implement cameras better today. One of the ma major caveats with these cameras is that they require extensive tuning and algorithms that are usually proprietary and provided by the vendors. The vendors do not want to open source this. And lip camera is providing ways for the cam for the vendors to ship these libraries while you can still use them open source together with Lip Camera that provides a nice API for everyone to use instead of having to resort to custom camera applications that are specifically built for these vendor libraries. Then the final mention is that we don't have great UX for most cameras outside of Android right now, but we'll show you something on that later. Sorry. 
Now, why don't we let Angelo throw some more of this controversy into the mix? Yeah, well, sometimes the other side really gets the best hardware. Yes, there are some Linux-based um, ARM64 laptops run, but you know sometimes it's just that you want that look and feel or set of features of laptop A, um, which may not be available on laptop B. Um, or maybe you'd like to have the ability of running both Microsoft Windows and Linux on the same machine because you also like Windows. Wait, 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 Angelo. This is a Linux conference, man. Ah. We weren't talking about how much everyone loves Windows? No, we are saying that we love Linux. This is open all after all. Oh yeah, Linux. Uh, nobody wants Windows. That's the spirit. Or maybe not. I mean, the world is not perfect. Um, sometimes some applications that you really need to run on your laptop are made for Windows, and sometimes you just can't get away with, with virtualization or with Wine and such. Even if I wish we could literally run everything on Wine, then not emulator, not Wine, even though it would be interesting to build a Wine powered computer. Let's get serious again, should we? Um, so this is what already happens every day. Uh, when you buy a regular x86 or 64 laptop, it usually comes with Microsoft Windows pre-installed. Um, so there's something who chooses a dual boot configuration, and there's someone else who just wipes the drive and installs Linux. There's nothing to be ashamed or even upset about. As I said, sometimes you really need both. Even I, a Linux user since literally forever, I mean, need to have Windows on one machine because I really love a guitar amplifier software that's available only on there. Not to mention some video editing app applications or others that are not available on Linux and that cannot run on Wine. I really hope that things will get better in the future and as soon as possible, but that's the hard truth for now. In any case, Let's say you got back home with that shiny new ARM64 laptop. You booted it, checked out performance, and yeah, absolute beast, you love it. But now you miss something, and that something is your favorite Linux distribution. You know what's fun? That's mostly the same as running it on your smartphone, as that may even be the same SOC. Well, maybe just like that, slightly different, but. It may just work if the smartphone variant of it is already supported upstream and vice versa. Though there's something that does not compute here and something that does. <laughs> Let's go with a brief explanation of how the boot process works. Your x86 laptop starts with the UEFI BIOS, which then loads your operating system or loader on your hard drive. Then before booting the actual operating system kernel, which may be Windows, Linux, BSD, or whatever else, it gives to it something called a CPI tables, describing the hardware inside the machine entirely so that the operating system can choose the right drivers with the right configuration and make things to work. Uh, but your ARM64 laptop is that that may be a little more complicated. If it's made for Linux, it'll start with some bootloader which may or may not be UEFI. In this case, it'll give a similar description of what's inside uh, to the target operating system, and that's called device tree. However, if it's made for Windows, it'll start some bootloader which will be UEFI compliant. And in this case, the hardware description will be a CPI. On ARM64, the golden standard is in Linux is to boot using the device tree and not a CPI. But in not so recent times, ARM64 Linux also started to understand a CPI like it's done on x86. So what's the problem here? It works, right? Well, that's not the full story. Um, there is a difference in the ACPI tables between x86 and ARM64. In fact, on the latter, it, to make more advanced things to work, like some highly optimized power management, cameras, or even some less advanced things, such, such as I2C and SPI buses, your display and such, they have invented a new ACPI table called PEP, or 
platform extension plugins. Now, that's the problem. All of the ACPI tables have been pretty much standard since the beginning of time, but the new PEP one is not. <laughs> In fact, sometimes these tables aren't even compatible between Windows driver updates on the same machine. Then these tables are practically vendor defined. The chip maker decides what goes in it. And yes, there are some guidelines on their format, but they're not very strict, which poses a big problem when you're, you're trying to boot Linux with ACPI tables on ARM64. How are you supposed to read a description of the hardware if its format varies wildly? And this is why people just scratched off that idea from the list. Linux can probably boot your ARM64 laptop on ACPI with a reduced feature set. Maybe your display will work. You get a terminal and maybe sometimes a keyboard or USB. Uh, but there are some exceptions. Um, and it's never a full feature set, but that's about it. So everyone started writing device trees for laptops and injecting them in a way or, or another. So you see the difference between a x86 laptop and an ARM64 one, right? Um, if you, you're thinking that it's probably a big mess, well, maybe. Uh, also, did I mention that in the opposite way, Windows does not support device tree, but only a CPI? So if you buy a laptop that's meant to run Linux, there will be no way of running that known open source to file reoriented system because, well, that's not open source again. So you have no way of adding device tree support to its kernel. On the bright side, there are some ARM64 Windows laptops that are supported on Linux. Some powered by Snapdragon 835, 850, and others, um, even the newest Snapdragon 8CX. And that's all thanks to big community efforts. Um, and this is why we also brought the, this topic here. We will do everything that is in our possibilities to make our ARM64 laptop, if we get one, to work on Linux, and we will succeed, either as either we as some mainline or, more importantly, we as a community. But there we go again. We need vendors to start doing something standard on this architecture as much as they do on the more popular one that is x86. Otherwise, laptops will be deprecated because you won't be able to run the latest software again, like consumer smartphones. More waste onto the pile. Also, I know quite a lot of people who repurpose old laptops to be small servers, and these machines work fine on Linux. Why should we throw them away instead? Right, just like Windows. Android seems to be a tricky concept in the industry. And many people seem to think that there is either a Linux phone nowadays showing up or an Android phone. But did I tell you, Android runs mainline just as well. So the question is, should we be afraid of Android? Of course not, because we can usually share the mainlining efforts between Android and other Linux distros freely. Android runs well on, on a mainline Linux kernel, mostly thanks to the effort throughout the years to integrate all their downstream patches into the upstream kernel tree. The only thing that remains is the generally hardware-specific user space components we've mentioned before. Let me show you some of these components that we already are using in Android. So, one of the major components that I probably mentioned before is Massa. Massa contains all the GPU drivers you may need for your Adreno GPU or other GPUs that are being used. It provides Vulkan drivers as well. Android heavily uses either of them. It's great that we can actually just share that. There's quite a bit of specific Android-specific code in there, but it's worth it for being able to share the entire rest of the driver. Any changes I make to fix Android bugs will also fix all the corruption that we see on normal Linux distros as well. Then we have the DRMHW composer. This is a custom open source compo component that is supposed to use the DRM KMS interface. It itself is not really repurposable on a mainline dit on a dis on another distro. However, it uses all the generic DRM interfaces, which is great. And finally, we have GDM Gralog. That is a wrapper library around Massa's libgralog, an allocator using the Android Hall interface. And some more small components. GPSD is a library that allows you to use GPS on, on your device. And with some small modifications, 
they are exposing a GNSS API or HAL for Android to use so that Android can also figure out the location of your device. Neat. And the modem, this is a bit of a tricky concept because most of the tools like the QRouter tools and QMI tools and services can already be compiled to Android and you can run them from the command line. Unfortunately, as we will see later, there is no real glue layer between that and the radio interface layer from Android. So you cannot just already, you cannot yet use this to play any calls, unfortunately. And finally, we have a bunch of smaller components that we are riding on together with a couple other folks in the industry and the community. These are like a vibrator driver or an LED driver. The, the nice part of this is that the whole driver that we're going to write for Android is going to be able to use standard Linux SysFS interfaces that we've all come, in, come used to. So I'm just going to write one for my Sony phone, and anyone else can use it on their other phone, as long as it runs mainline and exposes the same interface. But Android is not the only user space component that we've been working on. Let's take it to Martin to show what other distributions and applications we have in store for you. Thank you for the birth money. So now for some, some mainline specific stuff. Most of you probably know us as the crazy guys who upstream a lot of phones. And while we are mostly that, we now also have a user space developer or even two. And for a good while now, Oleg has been working on our very own camera app for running Linux on your phones. The name we, uh, we decided on is Hyperfocal. And while the app is still very much in alpha, we feel like words just don't do it justice. So how about we show it to you with a little demo? Give me a second here because I will have to switch out some things and share my screen. For this to work properly. Okay, share your screen. There we go. So this is our hyperfocal application. As you can see, it's still very much in alpha, but it works pretty decently. So let's start with the options here. Uh, on the uh, gears, we have a choose to backend. And that is sort of a way of letting us configure more than one device. Because as you know, um, phones use different way of handling it and etc. So we have to have a way of letting more than one camera use it. Uh, then we have the information which just shows like stuff. As you can see, it's still <laughs> alpha. Oleg hasn't cared to write the proper description for it yet. Then we have a show a way of showing grid. So you can take a picture that is properly gridded and zoom. And also, if you don't like the UI, you can absolutely write your own with <laughs> by choosing another one. Uh, then you also have a way of choosing the gallery where you want to save pictures and etc. And here you can disable or enable your our internal gallery or use the external one provided by your camera application. So next up we have the filters which are only working so far is the gray one and other ones are sort of crazy. Let's look at one and you will see why. They are definitely not ready and the equations will have to be sorted out by Oracle later, but it is proof of concept, which is <laughs> quite crazy as you can see from everything of this. But let's clear it and let's actually take a picture. So. As you can see, I took a picture and I can actually use the inside gallery and look at the picture and then go back. But let's say that you don't like the internal gallery because it is bare bones. So let's take another picture and let's open up the gallery, normal one. As you can see, it shows us where the application has been taken and properly shows the picture itself. 
and it takes the picture in the raw format as well. So I think that is pretty much it about the camera app. There will be more things definitely coming our way, but for now it's pretty all right. Let me turn back on my camera. There we go. And now for some void Linux builds, as I promised. <laughs> so uh, I hope you liked the demo, but as I said, we have to move on. And while it's bare bones, we are preparing to move more into open space. Such one jump we can unveil today is our void Linux builds. So what is somewhat special about our build of Linux? Well, for one, we do not ship an image specific for whatever phone you may have. It would be crazy. We implemented the one image to rule them all, kind of. The advantage to this is that you can be sure that it's not your specific build of the image if something works for others and doesn't work for you. This was huge for us as we are mainlining many phones and wondering if it was the user space or kernel screwing us with uh, no errors when they were not visible can be a huge pain to deal with. But it doesn't mean you can't build your own image for testing, you absolutely can. When you go to our GitHub, you'll see void bootstrap for creating the image itself and void packages where we host the packages we provide in the image itself, images themselves as well. But it should be noted that these were designed with mainline Linux in mind. And while they may work with downstream kernel, we cannot guarantee anything at all. And as to keep them up to date, we'll be building a public image that you will be able to download from our website every month. And the best part, we hated to always refresh our internal storage. Not only does it damage the flash cells, it's also a massive pain to deal with. Why? Well, sometimes Fastboot doesn't flash it correctly or flashes it to wrong slot. And then you boot the old image and have all sorts of issues and etc. Since the image is made for one, since we have one image that is made for every device, as uh, it's recommended to flash it to an SD card. And if you want to test on another phone, you don't have to guess if the image will work or not. Grab the SD card, plug it in, and if you go to testing. Or, well, whatever you want to do. The choice is yours, after all. And if you ever want to use it as a stable phone, you can just flash it to an internal storage, and there is no reason to hold you back there. But enough about this. Let's move to something more fun. Quite literally. When we started making this presentation, we had no idea this was even possible, but it turns out that this just requires a bit of work to get working. Steam with your phone. Now, doesn't that just sound fun? <laughs> All you need is Box86, by the way, amazing jobs to the devs of this wonder software, or other emulation software of your choice. It's just that simple. But I can already hear you saying there is no point if you can't run games on it. And well, yes, people do run it mainly on low power SBCs, which aren't powerful enough to run any decent game. And people also use it mainly for Steam Link, which is okay and coolish, but not where we are headed. And Considering our phones are just more powerful than good old Raspberry Pi or any low power single board computer, we think it's possible to run some games or even launching Steam VR. While, yes, it would not be the best experience at all, I mean, maximally like 5 FPS, it's in the territory of, oh wow, get this off of me and feeling safe for the rest of the day, but still extremely cold nonetheless. And we have to move on, and I can already uh, hear. Uh, we have to move on, and I can say that when I heard this was possible, I was definitely on board. So I will be trying to make it somehow work, and we'll see where we get to. Maybe next year we'll be here speaking and already presenting you a running game on our phone through Steam. But of course, it has its issues as all things do, so let's see what mainline and companies could do better, shall we? So what could they do better? Well, let's start with the companies, of course. Documentation. People may think, well, it's documentation. What is it for? 
I don't need it for using the phone. And yes, for normal usage, it's kind of pointless. But for developers, it's a holy grail and truly comes useful. This doesn't come for only phone makers, but also SOC companies. We understand that it's their intellectual property after all, but releasing some things would allow the community to build incredible things and not waste time on looking for the magic address to send the magic byte sequence to make something work and then continue with more of the same. And they're just making developer life harder because anyone can look into the kernel they provide and see with print where things are sent and what is being sent. But it's absolute pain to do so and just waste time. So documentation will be far better. But we can't say much wrong about the mainline documentation either. Maybe there are two file types that are currently supported, but that's also work in progress and maintainers and developers themselves are solving these issues. The rest of the things for companies I want to say will just mention as they were mentioned just in previous slides. Take it like a sum of all the things we said. So that's selling original replacement parts. I can't argue with companies are making the steps in the right direction being eco-friendly, but this is absolutely one massive step they have to take. As Angela mentioned as well, RM64 laptops are sort of a huge mess with ACPI and etc. ARM devices have been using device trees ever since they were invented. And it works very well. While ACPI may be great, it's just another thing to add to the pile to take care of. So instead of using two different things, companies maybe should focus on supporting only one and supporting it very well. Now for this place. First of all, while probably impossible to get developers some way of detecting which display we have in device without having to open up the device or look in downstream sources. And yes, of course, there are other ways. But the companies also use should use one panel for one device. And it's absolute pain for developers to account for such thing. But let's now move to mainline Linux. And well, we don't really have much to say here. Even if things are kind of wrong, they are being worked on to be corrected actively, like the documentation. While having two file formats for documentation, developers and maintainers themselves are working on making the transition and new drivers are required to use the new format. Maybe what I can nitpick is the slow review process, but vast majority of the people doing the reviews are not paid to do it. They are simply doing it in their free time. But I will get into how you could help with this in a few slides, so keep watching. And with that, let's see what our plans for 2022 are. You may think that open source private contributors don't really have a plan, but really, if you can see the full picture and you have a target, you must also have a plan of action. Um, yes, there are some people around that don't really have one and they are doing great, but we prefer planning our way so as to be more efficient to with our contributions. After all, um, if your ARM64 board can render 3D at 4K but cannot display it, that's not a great one, is it? Before I go on, though, I must give a big disclaimer. You know that we do this in our spare time. We always try to give our best, and we do, but doing this, as I said, as spontaneous contributors doesn't always let us to stick to a certain time frame. So please take this as as what we wish to do in 2022 and please understand our situation and be gentle with us in case we won't be able to finish this in that specific time frame. First of all, we really want to see this pandemic being finally over. The shortages that it caused are not really important if you think of it. It changed the world forever, but the most important thing here is that we really miss handshaking, we miss hugging with friends and we miss living how we've always done until this all started. I hope you were luckier than me and then during this period you haven't lost any friends, family members or others, but otherwise I'm really sorry. We as so mainline cannot do anything about that, but if there was anything we could have done, we would have been doing it as our first priority. 
Well, actually, there is one thing that we can do, and that's right here and right now. Please, people, stay healthy, stay safe. And let's hope that next year this will become only a bad memory. I'm sorry for this bittersweet talk, uh, but we felt like we had to say something about it. So let's get back on track. Linux. So as you may already know, um, we've been Linux kernel addicted and working only on that. But one day we stopped for a moment and started facing the hard truth. There's no point in running the latest and greatest kernel if there isn't any great user experience for smartphone sized Linux smartphones that are not running Android. These machines are very powerful, so we can indeed run heavier things like desktop environments with GTK, QT, or whatever else. Um, we know that there currently are efforts to make things a bit more friendly, and that's a good thing. But what if we can perhaps give our own contributions to that as well? For that reason, we started looking around for great developers that want, want to contribute to user space things, and our Oleg is one of them. Um, we believe that we are facing a point in time in, in which uh, basic hardware in advanced smartphones started working quite well. Um, so we may get more developers interested in upstream if we give them some incentive, if we let them see some light out of the tunnel. Of course, this doesn't mean that by doing more user space development, we are stopping our work on upstreaming new platforms and new SOCs on the Linux kernel. We enjoy that a lot, and we will keep having fun with that as we have all, always done. Counting how many devices uh, we helped upstreaming and how many others we have upstreamed on our own this year, uh, we would like to keep going like this next year, even though maybe we will have some pauses around improving some drivers. But that's anyway obvious, isn't it? Um, speaking of drivers, has anybody noticed that at least on Qualcomm smartphones, it is quite impossible to charge your battery on mainline Linux. Um, well, there are a lot of reasons uh, to, for that, but we we think that um, it's about time to stop that. <laughs> From what I know, uh, there are some people trying to develop a driver for the uh, chargers that are integrated in Qualcomm TMICs, and um, we are open to help them as much as we plan to write support for of hopefully more than just one PMIC charger. Let's see how that goes. And uh, also, let's plan some more. In uh, 2077, uh, detachable limbs will run Linux. So we are committed to <laughs> porting them upstream. But first, welcome power smartphones still miss something very important. For example, there is a very low power processor that is dedicated to processing data from the various sensors that are integrated in, in your smartphone. And you have many, like your accelerometer, magnetometer, gyroscope, and others. The firmware in this very low power system is grabbing data from all of your sensors, doing magic, and <laughs> creating virtual sensors for you like want to detect your steps, um, expected device orientation, a device pickup sensor, and again, many others. Uh, but there is no way to actually use this hardware upstream, um, not even the basic real hardware sensors when they are attached to that system. We think that this is critical to get a good user experience on a mobile since we all got used to smart features that are using this kind of sensors. Not to mention some that are there for safety reasons, detecting when you're putting the device near to your ear and reducing radio emissions. Let's see if we can get this to work sooner than later, uh, hopefully before 2077. Um, it's also worth noting that in Android, the radio interface layer, or RIL, uh, the piece of software, software that is responsible for managing your smartphone's modem, letting you send and receive SMS, and to start a mobile data connection, is open source, but only to a certain extent. Um, this makes the process of using your smartphone as a smart phone, uh, a bit complicated as, well, it doesn't make nor receive calls. And I'm not talking about LTE and such even. Uh, we would like to see an 
fully open source engineered stack, uh, for example, Ophono, that is currently available for known Android user space, integrated on Android as well. Also, we think that we will charge some more batteries in the meantime. And our hope is that the, the, the entire battery charging situation that we are experiencing right now upstream will be fully resolved sooner than later. If you remember our talk from last year, things changed quite a lot in, well, just one year. I wonder if we can go even faster than that and finally see companies releasing new smartphones running on mainline. That would be a dream come true. But hey, if more and more people start believing in, in this dream, it will become true. It is slowly becoming true already, after all. In any case, um, as you heard, we just spoke about big plans. And even bigger plans would need even more manpower. Right, Martin? Absolutely, Angelo. So call for developers. What do we exactly mean by that? Well, it's no surprise to anyone that Linux has a lot of developers. But you may be surprised that only a few stick around and contribute more. And because of this, many things are not touched for years to come. For example, only recently did the CD-ROM subsystem get a new maintainer. And that is sadly after years of being untouched. But same as mainline, we suffer the same thing, missing developers. There is only few of us and a lot of devices and hardware to mainline. After all, we all do it in our free time only. So if you share the same passion as we do and want to help out, you can contact us that you are interested in joining us and we'll see what we can do. And do not take it as a job or anything like that. We all do it for free and in our free time. You can take it sort of like a massive family from across the world. But as well as you can help us, you can also have the mainline Linux. You can come on the mailing list and start reviewing simple patches and slowly moving up. And then start reviewing something bigger. This can massively speed up the match process and maintainers would be even more happy to receive that help because it is truly immense amount of work they put into reviewing the patches to make sure that they are correct and just good. And well, with that over, I would like to thank you all for watching. We are very much excited to answer any questions you may have. So hit us up. Thank you. Uh, Martin, can you uh, read the questions so that? <laughs> oh, right, yeah. So what do we have here? Um, I guess I will start from the top, uh, which we haven't answered or you haven't answered yet, at least. Okay, yeah, I tried to answer it briefly. Yeah. In so do we have any plans on suspend and other power saving measures? Yes, we absolutely do. It's just that it's a bit more complicated because the interrupts have to be powered there and it requires drivers. Maybe Angelo could say a bit more about it. Yes, uh, well, uh, there are plans on, yeah, suspend and, and power saving. But like the, the thing is that right now, if you have no way to charge your battery and have mm, any notification for, hi, hey, your battery is at some critical level, it will be dangerous to actually forget your phone there and let it completely discharge because sometimes you will be in a situation in which uh, your bootloader won't actually charge your device, depending on how flat the battery is. So we have some power saving measures right now, uh, but mm, not, not the full set. And we think that this should come a bit later. Yeah, I can ask my question myself. So is there any <laughs> device you would recommend to buy and why? Ooh. That's a Ooh. hard one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, there is uh, there is something that I would uh, recommend to buy, which is the one that fits you the best. 
<laughs> we don't and know what what fits you the best. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't don't buy it for mainline support today because who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Absolutely, the, the phone may have... have any fixed plan. So if you want to buy a phone that runs mainline now, find one that runs mainline now. If you want to find one that maybe runs mainline in a year or two, that's the one you pick. Absolutely, the phone may have like minimal support from the mainline Linux kernel, but who knows? Maybe tomorrow or in a few days or months, someone will just send patches upstream and the phone will be fully supported for all we know. Um, what is the situation with DSPs? They seem to be used a lot of advanced features in proprietary firmwares. I think uh, Marine or Angela would be best suited for answering this question as I don't have much experience with that. All right, uh, unless Marine wants to Take this. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to let you take it first. All right. So, well, DSPs, uh, some DSPs do work, um, like the ADSP, CDSP. Um, there is something uh, that will make them work. Uh, but the, the actual interaction for the, um, let's say, really useful things that you are used to get on downstream Android that's a bit more complicated. Um, like there, there is something like some DSPs do necessarily have to be up for your device to actually even work in a stable way or have certain features like audio even recognized by the kernel. Um, letting go having drivers for it or not, that's another <laughs> different thing. Uh, so yeah, they sort of work, but not all of them and not great for a smartphone use case right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, also any device in some form supported in mainline that has Linux support. Running native Krita on native Linux distro with stylus on mobile device would be super cool. Okay, so the thing there is that it's not really device device thing. It's sort of touch screen that the touch screen driver in the mainline Linux kernel would have to support this feature. It's some some do, but I don't think we have any under our name that have a uh, style of support. But who knows? There are some that do have style of support. Um, yes, absolutely. But I mean, to, like, uh, not yeah, not smartphones. Yeah, it's rather rarity there. It's mainly used on bigger screens because people tend to use styluses on bigger screens. Yeah, well, generally though, uh, if you want some stylus support, that's uh, we are talking about some Samsung um, smartphone um, because I'm I'm not aware of any other that's really supporting that kind of stylus, like no. laptops apart Samsung ones. And there are some Samsung um, devices supported, but I think they're like MSMA 916. They they did, yeah. didn't even have the solid support, um, if uh, I'm not wrong. Does the RMI4 driver support styluses? Because if it does, then any RMI4 panel with hardware support for that should, in theory, just work. Yes. I, I haven't looked, but it may be possible that it supports it. But we will have to look. Lots. Yeah, but like there's no uh, device that currently just yeah. works on mainline that supports yeah, stylus apart from some laptops. Well, unfortunately, yeah. Okay. Any more questions we may have? Oh. Uh, oh thankfully, thanks. Windows phone use uh, UFI, it's easy to get mainline Linux booting on MSM 8x6 uh, Windows phone with EDK2 plus FFFB plus some patches from mainline for Lumia team. The DST DSP API files can also be decompiled to get information about the device's ACPI. Uh, okay, that's not really a question. <laughs> No, but that's an exploit, and uh, y yes, <laughs> absolutely. That's, that's not really uh, our intention uh, when mm -hmm. we say that we want companies to help. Uh, we yeah. should get companies to actually 
Uh, not less does find something obscure, but <laughs> which yeah. is even illegal in some countries. <laughs> so... <laughs> it's kind of the great territory that you are moving into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, speaking of the final thing, indeed, it would be nice if all Android phones have more or less a standard bootloader. We are now just looking into a new device that seems to have two stages of boot and two stages yeah. of DTE overla overlaying, which is insane and it makes it extremely complicated. Yes, three uh, actually. Three layers, sorry. <laughs> three. <laughs> which yeah, is it's even going bigger a bit, Yeah, it's going a bit like... <laughs> And the general, general kernel image Google has introduced is making a bit mess there. So, I mean, it, that's not too bad. Uh, the design okay. is good. I, I mean, yes, the design is good when you take it from the Android build system. When you build it outside, it's, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> let's not mention that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit more complicated, indeed. <laughs> We have another question in, in coming, I think. Possibly. Yes. Looks like it. Guys, I think you can unmute yourself and, and you can tell the question directly to microphone if you want. Ah, uh, have you looked into other SLC vendors like Mediatek and Unisoc? OK, um, for now, we are mainly focusing on Qualcomm SLCs. But we are definitely looking a bit into expanding to other SLCs in the future. Yeah. For us, Maybe. it's just that we happen to have Qualcomm devices on hand yes, right now. Yes, exactly. We're kind of sort of experienced. And like we said, anything that, that applies to one device usually applies to some other devices. So it makes it much easier mm -hmm. to just be lock yourself into that ecosystem. Absolutely. We seem to have like seven more minutes for questions. So you make it in the coming. Well, actually, actually, you can have questions 17 minutes yet, but. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh but OK. No one is asking. <laughs> yes, exactly. So OK, well, thank you for your talk. If no questions, we there, can... there seem to be. Qualcomm uh, is definitely helping a lot. The, yes, absolutely. I didn't really mention this, but with all the newer laptops like the SM8150, 8250, 8350, they're upstreaming these SOCs, so it makes it much easier for us to finish the things. Like I said in one of the slides, performance is not really an issue anymore <laughs> because they're literally implementing support for that. So most of our time nowadays goes to the older SOCs that they have not upstreamed and yes. to bringing specific device support for those SOCs and like the missing bits that they didn't have in their laptops. And maybe other quirks that some phones or devices may have that the original SOC or other original yeah. devices Definitely may not have. Works. The reference SOC always just works, and then our SOC has some strange behavior in some places, but we're definitely working on that. What about VR headset? They're also after Qualcomm. Yes, they are, and I wish uh, Oleg was here to talk about that because he would be very much excited <laughs> and <laughs> tell you a lot of things about it. <laughs> Well, but I can say something. Uh, yeah, go uh, on. Actually, VR headsets aren't uh, special in any way. Um, mainly, they are uh, smartphones with, like, in in a different enclosure. Um, even the SOCs uh, that Qualcomm are putting in their um, VR headset <laughs> reference and and such, um, <laughs> and uh, other companies are implementing like Oculus and and others. Uh, they are mainly, again, rebrands of smartphone SOCs, like they're doing with laptops and other use cases. So in theory, <clears throat> yes, they would work um, if their relative uh, smartphone uh, variant works on mainline. And I know of some of them that do work, like MSM998. There's a VR headset that uses MSM998 as Qualcomm XR or something or the XR2 that is um, 845 maybe. Um, but like the issue with VR headsets is that they are locked down to hell. So 
you cannot uh, install your custom kernel on them because you cannot unlock the bootloader. Otherwise, it would be possible. Yes, absolutely. Um, so let's move on. Qualcomm Automotive Mobaka. <laughs> okay. Uh, Certification-wise, I think that's a bit out, out of our league. Yes, absolutely. I don't think we have any cars that can run mainline yet, and I do not think Angelo is crazy enough yet to port it. Though, you know, he's crazy Italian, really? so... Really? <laughs> I want to donate the car for you. So he, he may as well, you know, you never know. Okay. Uh, also, and also Android. Um, yeah, mainline supports Android just fine. You're definitely working on bringing the remaining yes. user space bits to get that to work, but there are no extra patches needed to boot Android besides just filling your dev config up with a ton of extra features. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just run it. And well, our plan was to publish some mainline tr Android trees. We're still working on that with some other community members, but as we said, we are so freaking busy that we haven't really gotten to that yet, but we are working on it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, Xperia Touch Mainline proje uh, Projector. <laughs> I think uh, I think we had something in the slides for that, but in the end, it ended up being deleted. Um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, why not? Like, I mean. MSM and 956, uh, so yes. it's the same status. Um, yes, but actually, I wonder why, uh, you know, I mean, like, why exactly? Because you... it's cool, of course. Okay, okay. right, right. You're yeah. going to bring the Keystone communication server back from <laughs> that, but you can yeah. bring it up on mainline. Well, that's that's not hard. That's just serial. Uh, but, yeah. like, actually, we should, uh, we forgot to share um, something about um, how we started with Doiri um, on mainline. That was because I initially wanted the projector on mainline. So we said, okay, let's start from smartphones. If we break some, we're not losing losing two thousand two thousand euros of <laughs> of hardware. Uh, and then we bring the projector uh, there as well. Uh, but you know. <laughs> Okay, and last question from Dan. How can I submit patches for you to review? Should I submit straight to a Linux kernel mailing list? There are two ways we have. Uh, you can submit a PR to us, but we more prefer the way of just sending it straight to a Linux kernel mailing list and just mentioning us in CC. We will absolutely look at the patch and review it. Yeah. If you feel CC free us. To, feel free to publish a branch anywhere on GitLab or GitHub and send a link to us if you want us to take a, yeah. take a look. But if you think it's just generally applicable, just send it upstream immediately and yeah. CC us. We'll take a look. Also, there's something more. Um, if you think that it'll be um, better if we actually dedicate an email um, for reviews, uh, mm -hmm. like kernel at somainline.org or something like that so that you avoid to CC every one of us in each yeah. uh, patch. We can also do that. Uh, probably that that would be a good idea. OK, what should I CC to? OK, I can send you in the chat like our emails for uh, reviewing it. OK, so that's me, uh, Marine. Dot Sweetan at so dot org. Xperia Pro one inch sensor mainline. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there was some discussion. Yes. <laughs> we want to, but it's more complicated than that. Yeah, a bit. Sorry. Like An Angelo, you will have to. Uh... You will have to write your own email in the uh, in the chat because yeah, yeah your sure. name. Um, I just thank this? you. <laughs> okay. Yummy. There we go. CPR three four getting closer. Um, yes, um, there are 
interests uh, in merging my CPR uh, 3.4H uh, patch, but um, I've been like I've been pinged by uh, some of our guys uh, to actually clean it up again for the 14th time. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is that like you know porting it to every kernel version and such uh, is a bit uh, time consuming, uh, even though it's, it's just porting and not a real cleanup. And the thing is, uh, I've been a little, a little pretty much busy with uh, work and some life things. Um, so I haven't had any occasion to uh, port it again and uh, resending it, but yeah, all it takes is uh, just a couple of hours of reporting and and resending. And I promise I will do it uh, as soon as possible, as soon as I can, as soon as I can. <laughs> okay, uh, some inline Epo M1 upstream. <laughs> well, I think Conrad is interested in that, but um, I do not think he has one yet. But he, the M1 he, works. Yes, absolutely, it does work. There are people that are working on it daily, and they are absolutely doing an amazing job. All right. But who knows? Conrad is unpredictable at best. So <laughs> who knows? <laughs> and one last question, I think. By the way, so mainline, what does it mean? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the main specifically doesn't mean anything. We just sorted jokingly said like we were designing on a name and we were questioning the main line and what we did. So we, Conrad, I think, like last second just dropped in and said like, oh, oh, was was <laughs> oh, oh, okay, it was Angela then. <laughs> they just dropped in and like said, okay, maybe we should do so mainline because like mainline and so, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the joke was so mainline, much Linux, wow. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> it, it just sort of jokingly. Yeah, yeah. But we wanted to rename, but later we decided that, ah, <laughs> nah, we, we will leave it. <laughs> yeah. OK, guys, I think there are no more questions, so. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, if, Thank you as well. if someone wants to discuss more, there will be a next session, a discussion session at 4 p.m. So mm -hmm. you can join with your question, with your discussion. Uh, I will be happy to see you also to discuss, to, to put your question or, or on others. And um, uh, we are, we will continue in 10 minutes. So. Let's have a break and then I will have my talk about Nemo Mobile. Um, there is a pool if you want to hear it in English, um, <clears throat> English, <laughs> then, then you can vote and uh, see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.